Welcome back to the reality of roasting, everyone. We are headed into session three, and I'm super excited to announce our third presenter for today. And it's at this point that I want to give a massive shout out to Mill City Roasters and introduce you to Stephen Green, the CEO of Mill City. Hi, Stephen. Jazz hands. <laughs> And Hawaiian shirt. Yeah. This is, Loving this is not shirt. Hawaiian. This is something else. I don't know. <laughs> we can go with whichever. I'm, I'm going to be as PC and not racist as possible. And if I came off as being racist, I apologize because I called no, no, no. that shirt a Hawaiian <laughs> shirt. <laughs> well, you never know. Days. You can get into a lot of trouble by just saying things like, let's go for Asian food. Anyway. So, Stephen Green, before we do get started, I just want to say because of you, we're able to offer today's sessions for free and it is, uh, you know, I picked up the phone when we had decided that we couldn't go to Portland and do SCA and said to you, hey, listen, do you still want to support this event? We're going to do it online and you didn't hesitate. Uh, so thank you, sir. We appreciate it. You're no. very welcome. Yeah, very much so. Thanks for thanks for doing all the work. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, so, you know, we are going to have a chat today about an article that and some work that Anne has worked on with Rob Hoos. Again, shout out to Rob. Mm -hmm. uh, so. How we're going to how we're going to structure this session is that I'm going to, as the least experienced roaster in the room, I'm going to explain to people uh, what the article is and what I understood from it, and then um, what's going to happen from there is Anne's going to tell me if I completely cocked it up or I got it right, and <laughs> she's going <laughs> to fill in the gaps. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another Australian term. And then we're going to take the discussion from there because uh, we have the person who wrote, who co-wrote the article about, you know, roasters and, and roasting machines. And we have a roasting machine manufacturer here. So let's uh, dive into it. So yeah. the article was called, Can You Taste the Roasting System? And it was published in... Roast Magazine. Exactly when was it roast it, published in Roast? Um, it was in the May-June article, uh, May-June issue last year. Right. But, yeah. Okay. It's and <laughs> and so the article makes a preface. It, it, the preface is um, that as an industry we assume that it's the roasting machine that determines how a coffee is going to come out not the roaster and the roasting profile. So I think the specific um, quote was that uh, many, that there's a different, the, the differences in taste are derived from different placement thickness and types of thermocouples as well as differences in terms of the heat transfer controls. Theoretically, um, a bean and this is what our industry thinks, theoretically the bean is more influenced by the roasting machine than it is by the roast profile and the roasting style of the operator. And the article was focused on the idea or the, the, the research that you and Rob had done was focused on the idea of figuring out, well, is that true or not? It wasn't about proving it wrong. It wasn't about proving it right. It was in the proper scientific uh, way of doing things. Let's test the hypothesis. Yeah. And am I, am I doing okay so far? Yep. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so that's the basic preface of what we wanted to understand in or what you guys wanted to understand in the article. And you used the idea of um, of – you use triangulation as your mechanism for testing your hypothesis. And so taste was the primary driver behind how you tested whether your hypothesis was correct. And your method was based on a number of assumptions. And the assumption was that in the triangulation, 
and I'll get you to talk about some definitions in a minute, but in the triangulation, there was the, the three different roasts that you were tasting. All of them had the following constants of variables. So um, in each of the roasts, they ended with the same bean and ground colour. They matched time at yellowing. The time of first crack was equal between all of them. And the end of DTR or development time ratio was the same for all of them. And the idea was that if you roasted with all of those things as close to the same as possible, if you roasted those things on three different machines, if you roasted th the same coffee on three different machines with those three variables that are constant, you wanted to test if people in a blind triangulation could pick the difference. Correct. How did I do? Excellent. Pretty solid. Great. Nice job. Thank you. It was an extremely well-written article though. So it really was. It, it, your, your comprehension is like super low hanging fruit. <laughs> It was such a well. I'm just article. teasing. I'm just no, teasing. But you're right. That was and the great thing about the way it was written. It, like your presenting style, it was engaging, but it didn't make me feel dumb as somebody who hasn't ever uh, roasted anything before. And I got to tell you, your findings were fascinating. Yeah, mm -hmm. hundred percent. And and I guess for Rob and myself. Um, you know, some of the main um, reasoning behind it is as consultants, um, we get asked all the time, what's the best machine? Um, yeah. And so naturally roasters, when they're wanting to explore, um, you know, what machine do they want to buy? The natural thing is to get either coffee from, you know, different roasters because they know they're roasting on a specific machine mm -hmm. um, or even do their own test um, in terms of if they've got the opportunity to get the same coffee and roast it on different machines. But for those that did that exercise, I don't think they thought it through in terms of how best to match and, you know, really using the profile as the thing that influences flavour, not the machine. Um, and that's where, um, you know, Rob is fantastic in the sense of um, I really learnt such amazing lessons working with him in the sense of the, the whole premise behind Prove It. I'll never forget the moment he just looked at me when we were talking about this topic and saying, man, I get asked all the time about bloody machines. Um, you know, how do I, how do I answer this really well and how do we go about proving that you know it's not necessarily the machine we've got we want roasters to pull their socks up and and own up to you know how they how they get to know their machine and and their and how they're roasting and understanding their flavors um and stop blaming you know the machine and the green and everything else like you've, you've got to they've got to look at themselves but essentially i'll never forget him looking at me and going well we have to prove it and i'm just like do you know how huge that's going to be? <laughs> well. And and he's like, well, yes. And that's why it took us like almost three years um, to get all of that. It started in 2017 and the, and then, then the lead up to the article um, and then um, and then it's kind of, kind of ongoing where I've now just tapped in, um, which I'm going to reveal today, is some really cool scientific analysis uh, where we did particle size analysis um, in terms of, showing how if you cook the coffee the same with the same profile, technically then the beans are like cooked the same and then when they're ground, they're going to chop the same and extract the same. So yeah, wow. we've done some really cool scientific, you know, um, sort of backup from that as well. But, yeah, just uh, I can't thank Rob enough for his um, experience and guidance in that whole premise of doing research yeah. and especially in roasting. Um, where there's just so many different variables um, to consider. Um, it's about just do, you, again, do your due diligence, yep. collect your data and know where to, where to direct that data. Um, and so, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the first time we did it, it was really hard. The first, the first round of experiments were... That was at Firestarter, right? Yeah, so, In... um, and we, we chose, we naturally chose the machines that, that are considered quite um, opposite in the sense of we did Diedrich, Loring and Probat um, in terms of, you know, they're, they're different enough systems and they have enough what I call 
community claims or myths about them that if you use this roaster, you'll get this particular flavor. Right. And we're kind of like, well, I can see you know, is yeah, and which is great. And this, <laughs> and this is and this is where we had to be, you know, very respectful and very professional in in you know in dealing with um, you know the manufacturers and how we're dealing with um, talking about their machines because. Right. Essentially, as, as I've said, we're, we're kind of blowing up some marketing material for these manufacturers. Um, but the way that we sort of went about, went about trying to talk about it and, you know, talking about how it's, it's great information for the manufacturers, the, you know, our findings. But again, I will always be the first one to be tough on the roasters, the people themselves. Mm -hmm. I will always be the one to say, you've got to, you've got to get to know this machine. You've got to understand it and you've got to understand your own, your own style and preference. Um, well, but yeah. I, I just want to say something at that exact point, because my big takeaway from this article, and I wrote it down, this information and this information being the article forces people to understand what they're doing and it reveals to people that, well, it reveals to the industry when you force people to accept this, that a lot of people don't actually understand the technical aspect of what they're doing. And that makes people uncomfortable, right? So what we're trying to do with particularly the mastermind groups with you is say, hey, listen, like you don't have to admit to people you don't know what the fuck you're doing. We're going to teach you, mm. right? And and I think because roasting um, and this is where it's amazing, like with like all the videos that that um, you guys do, Steve, City, um, doing, yeah. City, like just phenomenal. Because as an industry, people are always looking for the way. What is what is just just tell me the way. And right. as we know, there is there's no, a, the it's, way. It's, it's, no, like it, it's hard to say. Like the, one of the questions that we got in the Q and A was like, is there a standard way of roasting? I'm kind of like. Initially, I kind of just went, oh, pff, like, no. But then it's like, well, when you get to know your machine, it there becomes a standard way on how you move through your roast. But, yeah, in general, though, it's such a dynamic industry because right. there's just so much to to consider. But there is a way to to strip away all the crap and, and really simplify it and give yourself a chance to enjoy it and focus on it and – and that's where I, in, in the sense of saying as simply as like trying to show that it's the profile that influences flavour, um, you know, not necessarily the machine and start right. with the triangulations and, and the tasting. Um, yeah. So let's take a – before we bring Steve in, I just want to kind of talk about what the results were yep. that you got. And the results, uh, as you said, you had three machines from three different manufacturers. You used a Probat UG15 from Proud Mary's, you used a, a Loring and S35 and used a Dietrich IR5. Uh, the Loring was with Padre Coffee and the Dietrich was at Veneziano. And this was at Firestarter. Yeah. Right? And so then, go ahead. I was going to say then uh, from year to year we then, you Brought know, on more start, machines start bringing the whole different thing. machines. Right. Yeah, 100%. So, yeah. So, from the 529 triangulations, you had 27 testers on the first day, 39 on the second day. So it's not like you had four people mm. that were responsible for all of these tri triangulations. From the 529 triangulations that were tasted, 163 were correctly identified, uh, which comes to 31%. And you draw an, another interesting correlation in the article uh, that, you know, that that 31% became comparable uh, it, it, as the, the sample size grew to 1,689 triangulations. Uh, the, the, that number was around 29, well, it was exactly 29.54%, which was not much of a deviation. But the other correlation that you drew, which was fascinating to me, was the probability of people guessing mm. in a triangulation is 33.3%. And when you take that into um, into consideration, uh, the you can't discount that when you're looking at these numbers. And it just really does create the basis for a fascinating discussion. And and uh, you know, this is where you turn around and say, well, where's the relationship now sit between? 
personal responsibility and manufacturer input when it comes to roasting, right? Yep. And this yep. is where I want to bring Steve in yep. to join the discussion. Yep. Um, and, and Steve, I guess I'd love to start by asking you, provided and you agree that I've, that everything that I've said was, do, does anything need correcting of what I said? No, no. And mm. I think maybe, yeah, um, 100%, let's, yeah, let's chat with Steve and maybe towards the end, um, you just can bring for the, data. just, yeah, just for the viewers, yep. just to kind of like show, um, it's just, we can just visually see um, the dark, like the, oh, what we mean. Yeah. Okay. I think that'd be great. But great. yeah, this is, yeah, definitely. Let's, let's go to Steve. Let's go to Steve. So Steve, uh, I'd love to start with you by saying, by, by asking you what, was your impressions of the article? I know that you you think it was well written, but what is your what are your thoughts about the article and the the research? Well, I, for for me personally, it it confirmed what my suspicion all along. I, you know, I, I've been screwing around with coffee for 10, 11, 12 years, and uh, cycled through a seemingly endless succession of machines, some of which I built myself, some of which I designed myself. But I, you know, I've, I've been elbows deep in roasters from every single manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And, and to sum it up, what, what I probably would have made the, the title of your article is, um, control tastes good. All right. <laughs> right. I, and I, and I think, I think your findings kind of speak more to the and I you know I don't want to be negative about this I mm. and I don't I don't mean it to be negative but the truth is you know you say 31% was almost identical to a random selection well the truth is it was a random selection because nobody can taste the difference between a machine in the first place you know I mean you're you you start with a some assumptions and one of the problems in the industry is that you know, you have your probat roaster behind you and you've been roasting on it for um, a number of years and you've probably spent, you know, 10,000 hours at it and you've figured out how to coax good coffee out of that machine. And, you know, if you are an average roastery, a single owner occupied roastery, or, you know, you're in your own local market and that's as far as you take it, that's all that you know. Mm, yes. So, yep. you know, you you don't get out and compare and then you say well you know you can go to roasters guild and there's machines from all manufacturers but that's not the way roasters guild works typically you're on a team and you're assigned a machine and you're lucky to roast on two you know yep. you actually have to make a real effort to get out and compare machines and then it's the first time you've ever roasted on that machine so whether your coffee turns out or not is a total crapshoot right mm -hmm. so what i see is you know, as an industry, we're a hundred billion dollar a year plus thing, and the vast majority of people are still drinking uh, stale commodity coffee as a delivery mechanism for caffeine. And you know, people are thriving in local markets serving fresh roasted commodity coffee as an improvement over the stale commodity coffee, right? And those people kind of feel like, hey, I figured this out. I'm making money. I'm a good roaster. Well, maybe they are. You know, maybe they're not. But my, I guess my point is, is that the the experience of the average player in this industry is ex, is very much more excruciatingly limited than they understand. There's very very few of us that you know, have, have spent a lot of time on a lot of different machines, spent a lot of time with a lot of different coffees, spent a lot of time with a lot of different roast profiles. I actually understand, I personally, I, I'm i not going to say that um, I'm a competent roaster. I know how the machinery works, and I know what happens in the seed. If you held a, a gun to my head, I can probably produce coffee that you want to pay to drink. Well, in that know. shirt, sir. How could you not? <laughs> exactly. That's right. <laughs> but again, to be completely redundant, I, I, you know, that we've got a real problem and, and maybe it's not a problem. I mean, what the way that I see this is number, I see it in terms of sustainability. 
So in, in, a, in a post COVID-19 world, when we are going to be receiving um, thousands of containers full of poorly processed coffee because mm -hmm. they didn't have the boots on the ground to sort it or it had to wait to get processed, yeah. the onus is gonna be on us as professionals to figure out how to make use of that coffee. You know, we can't just arbitrarily sort out the 60 or 70% of, of any given coffee to make it specialty, to make it palatable. We're gonna to have to figure that out. And if we're really concerned about sustainability in the industry, we're gonna to have to become better cuppers. We're gonna to have to become better roasters. Yeah. You highlight what Anne's talking about in her article, which is people need to get better equipped with an understanding of how, of what they're doing and how to make the roaster execute on the ideas and the knowledge of what they're trying to produce. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you both agree that that's what we would aspire to uh, empowering people to do as an industry? Like that's where sure. we need to be heading? I mean, that's where I, I keep writing the checks. You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm actually putting my, my money where my heart is in this. Yeah. We are actively engaged and, and trying to help people do a better job at their machine, do a better job with their green selection, do a better job. Yeah. You mentioned in your presentation the difference between pre-roast and post-roast blending. Blending is going to be a big deal this year. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a huge deal. And people need to, you know... The folks that don't wrap their arms around that, that don't, you know, kind of engage in that a little bit, they're going to be less successful. Yeah. So. What are your thoughts on all of that, Anne? Yeah, I mean, I think like a, it's it's definitely highlighting, um, I just keep on having this vision of, because it, in relation to Steve, when he said in terms of when people get caught in their own bubble and they don't get a chance to try a different machine mm -hmm. or when they're learning how to roast and, and it, it's highlighting that element of, how do I step up and make a decision? What do I know about roasting? Like, like it's that's highlighting. That's a great, great what do, I, what do I know what about do I roasting? Know about, and that's what I was saying. It's it's the running joke in the industry, but we're all doing it. We're turning beans brown. It's how do you go from, from green to brown? So you step up to a different machine. You understand the control, um, how to control it. You understand the probe. What kind of data am I dealing with? Mm -hmm. um, you assign that data to your your key events. And you just learn how to drive to get to each event. Um, and I think that whole, I love the word control. I think that's really what, um, you know, it, it, it's underlying. It, it's all about that um, and how we understand that. Um, and like, especially like if you're in a situation where, and it did happen the first week of COVID, one of my um, clients, their roaster blew up. It just, just died. And so they're like, wow. I have to borrow your machine. I'm like, cool no problem and we just went through the whole stages it was basically can you taste the roasting system one and one on one kind of like and and it was fascinating when I asked them the questions I said what do you know about your tell me about your profile um you know where do you want to how how do you want to drive yourself through that green to brown process um and it was really interesting seeing what they did and didn't understand um you know, to help them feel relaxed about jumping onto a different machine, um, all that kind of stuff. But I think, yeah, control is the um, definitely a, a, a thing in terms of, you know, understanding those machines those and variables. Factors. Yep, yep. So, so one of the other takeaways in your article was that um, that the science shows that the probability that somebody could taste the roast, the, the roasting machine uh, in the triangulation was more probable that they could not than they could. And you make a comment in the article where what you say is that that doesn't mean that all machines are created equal. It just means that in the marketing that manufacturers of roasting machines uh, need to be doing is just building better quality machines, machines that last longer, um, machine that have better customer service. They have, it's the, not all machines are necessarily created equal um, in that sense. 
But there are other things that manufacturers can do. So I'd love for you and Steve to kind of talk that kind of thing out. Well, I think Steve's the best example because that's where Mill City's Mill City is nailing is exactly. nailing it in the sense of exactly. um, service. And that and that's that's genuinely genuinely, genuinely true in the sense that yeah, yeah ultimately the the ultimate outcome of the research was buy the machine you want to buy. Like and, you know, just because you can only afford a certain level of machine doesn't mean you're going to produce a bad product. You just need to learn how to use that that machine. But, yeah, definitely with the manufacturers, there was definitely a call in the sense of we want, we would love, you know, stronger relationships in terms of service, communication, backup. Right. Um, like, you know, maybe more so for us down here in Australia being so far away from, you know, all the manufacturers, like trying to get in touch um, with Europe and US, like for this roaster where their machine blew up and they had to get a part, you know, sent from Europe. And I just went, oh, this is going to take forever to get here. Like, you know, we've got to deal with this. Um, What do we do? Um, And just trying to get through, I think definitely, um, you know, yeah, definitely manufacturers are starting. I'm, hoping you know, to realise in terms of definitely from that servicing perspective, that's always the common question. When we're looking to buy a roaster, the common question is um, who's your backup um, for service and, mm-hmm. and how does that um, how does that happen? But definitely from the education perspective, um, I mean, yeah, I think who, who else besides Mill City is actively, you know, posting you know such amazing content online about about roasting and I mean if it wasn't yeah I think um Steve <laughs> in terms of so I mean, let me speak to a, let me speak to a couple things here sure, because yeah it is so I'm going to tell you my perspective and you can you can comment on this what I've seen in in my journeys thus far is that number one, uh, the vast majority of manufacturers of roasters don't actually really, they're, they're almost more fabrication facilities. They're more welding shops and they're good guys. There's it's, it's hard to buy a bad roaster. Okay. Okay. Um, there are some exceptions that I'm, I'm not going to name names, but (laughs) We're not that, I think, that but I think, <laughs> but I think one of the things that happens is, you know, these machines are are it's an old technology. You know, it's a it's like okay, we need a rotating drum and a heat source, and we need airflow, and we need a tryer, and then whatever the interpretation of whoever cobbled that system together. Um, and listen, just to be real with you, I've been working in engineering for thirty five years. And I know exactly. Um, they took a they took a a young mechanical engineer with three or four years of experience because he's cheap, right? Mm-hmm. And they do a drawing and they make a thing, and he you know looks it up someplace and he thinks he knows what this is because it's simple, right? It's and just he likes coffee. coffee. Yeah, it's, yeah. He's, you know, there's, he's got a T-shirt. And, you know, they, they don't understand the process. They don't understand that, hey, you need a bunch of therms in the beginning of the roast because you've got a bunch of water in this seed. And somehow you have to impart heat to this batch without in, inducing heat defect. And then you need to you, you need to throttle it back to slow it down after that. Right. I mean, this is stuff that's instinctive to, to you and I. It, it, you know, they they don't know. So what happens is people point. on yeah. those systems end up gaming the physics of the machine to somehow get a better product or they just they just fill it up full of coffee and let it cook away for 20 minutes and bag it up and ship it to the nearest gas station and that's cool i'm okay with that gas stations need coffee too right (laughs) but i think the growth in the market is in quality and you know we build for we build the best machine we possibly can for the purpose of control so having said that, the other issue is, you know, we talk about, you know, this 33% accuracy rate. One of the issues is, and this happens all the time, and this is going to bear witness to you. People will buy a system 
And that system is, you know, probably most ideally suited to a specific sort of roast profile, right? Yes. Just in general, right? Yeah. If it's if it's got a rotational speed, a drum diameter, and the airflow characteristics and the heating characteristics, it will be most suited towards a sort of roast profile. Now, most right. people that buy that system, this is what happens to them. They put coffee in it and it's lousy and they don't buy that coffee and they put, they put a Colombian in it and it's great. And guess what? Now we roast Colombian. I, you know, it, it took me seven years to figure this out. I was talking to a guy and he says, we only, it was something crazy. Like we only roast, uh, you know, Haitian and, and <laughs> coffee from, I don't know where the hell it was, Guatemala or something. He like two varieties of coffee. Yep. And I said, why do you do that? And he's like, that's all that tastes good. Yep. And I'm thinking, okay, that's weird. Yep. Right. But I, I think that is a thing. And I think that this is these machines, you know, people don't listen. Thermal couples are new. You know, five, six years ago, you know, when I started, what I was doing was hot rotting ancient probats and primos, you know, for gas control mm -hmm. and putting a bean temperature thermocouple in because somebody, you know, wanted to be pals and I was the only person they knew that could change a tire. So I got stuck working on their machine, right? That's how I got involved in coffee originally, right? As, you know, semi-professionally. So this is, this is a new thing. And it's that, that data and the understanding and then Okay, there's one last thing I'm going to dump on you, and I'm sorry here. But, you know, one of the things is when I started 10, 11 years ago, 12 years ago, you could not get a straight answer from anybody about anything related to roasting, That's right? That's such a great point. And it wasn't because they were jerks. They didn't know. It was That's because right. they didn't know, yep. right? <laughs> and yep. nobody wanted to admit that the emperor had no clothes. Oh, so straight. the reason that we do the YouTube stuff, the reason I wrote you a check to do this thing is because I think that better coffee generates demand for more better coffee. Right. And I think that allows me to build better roasters and sell more of them. Well, the three of us are aligned on that kind of thing. It's like we've seen that there's a gap. We realize that people are scared to admit that they don't understand what they don't know. Sure. And we want to give them the opportunity to learn what they don't know in a way that brings them, keeps their dignity. You know, how can we help them get access to the information without them having to cop to the fact and step into that vulnerability in a way that they're probably going to feel ashamed of because come tomorrow and you'll understand why shame's a terrible thing. Um, because but, it's so simple at the end of the day, really. It's, it, it is. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yeah. Go I ahead, I'm never wearing this shirt again, for sure. Why? Why not? <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> I'm just I was but, but, but you you raise, uh, it's at the core of why we wanted to do this three-day thing, right? Because sure. this is an opportunity for us to draw a line in the sand and say, hey, listen, What's happened is that COVID's broken everything. And a lot of the questions that came through were people saying, is everything going to go back to normal? When's it going to go back to normal? Uh, uh, it, are our wholesale accounts going to going to be fine um, after this? Are we going to get all our business back? Can, can we just go back to roasting the way that we, like one version of all of that kind of stuff. Friends, if you're listening and you're waiting for that, date like when's the governor of your state or the the minister of your state going to turn around and say when's this all going back to normal it's not happening it's 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 not happening we are in a a new normal and it, the time ahead of us will evolve but our industry has changed permanently and let me help you understand why cafes were running at an average of three to six percent net profit if they were doing well now, if, if cafes are running at such slim margins and the majority of that revenue that they're earning is being eaten up by fixed costs, what happens is whether they do the business or not, they're going to get swallowed up by this 
But then people come out and say, well, all right, we're going to come back to some sort of normal. For the foreseeable future, though, you're only going to be allowed to run at somewhere around 20% of what you were running before. Now, if you were running at 100% capacity and you were making 3 to 6% net profit, and the majority of that was eaten up by fixed costs, and you've cut that down to 20%, You've already been in a situation you've, where you've been running at way less than 20%, almost nothing during this, you know, the time that we've all been closed and you're close to, to having to close shop. Now you're being told that indefinitely you're going to have to run at 20%. Not going to happen. Like it, it's broken. It's permanently broken. A new model has to emerge from this moment on. And you've got to adapt as quickly as possible in the most intelligent way that you can, which is why we decided to say, let's do this. Let's give people the opportunity to be better professionals. And the way that we do that is by empowering them with copying to what they don't know, by just showing up and listening to these incredible speakers um, and being able to inhale that knowledge and then move forward more intelligently in their decision making. That's the strategy behind this. Can I just say that? Please do. I think that uh, there's a micro and there's a macro to this. Right. Right? Yep. So we, the world is different today than it was six months from now. And it'll be different six months from now than it is today. Right. And people people are going to make small scale decisions, you know, for their, their own lives and their career, their profession. You know, one of the things is, I mean, one of the places where we've thrived and the, and the, the thing that the need that we've met is this, you know, there's um, coffee has traditionally been an entry level position. It's a low barrier to entry. You know, I'm going to be a barista. I'm going to be a front of counter person. Somebody's going to show me how to pull a shot. I wish somebody would teach me how to do latte art. I, I have no skill with that. It's but fine. You've got your shirt. That's true. <laughs> Lauren keeps telling me she will, but I never find time. So, By the um, way, someone in the chat has the yellow version of your shirt. Shout out to Jethro. And they wanted us to know that. <laughs> Tommy Bahama forever. So um, I guess what I'm, what I'm, where I'm going with this is, you know, people – this entry level thing, you know, if somebody's super jazzed about coffee and loves coffee and loves the culture and loves that it's a sensory driven thing and is super excited about it, the only way for them to make adult professional money has been to start their own thing. Mm. Right. But the barrier to entry is still low for that as well, because you don't have to know anything to do that either. You just have to have some capital. Well, but that's a thing, you know, I mean, most right. people start right. on a shoestring. And, you know, they start in their garage or they cobble together equipment and they find a lease, you know, and it, the reason that I wanted to do this as a company was because I wanted to help those people make decisions that maximize their freedom of choice. Yeah. And I think we're coming into that again. I think there's a lot of people out there who, who just discovered that their security is not in that weekly paycheck, you know, and, or they they've discovered that life is too short. And they're kind of they're looking to self-actualize and do something for themselves. And they love coffee and they love coffee culture. They love coffee people because we're love we're super lovable, right? And we hope so. Well, you are for sure. <laughs> I mean, I don't like anybody, and I like all of you. So there. <laughs> so, you know, I guess where I'm going with this is we we want to teach them to do better, to distinguish themselves in the yeah. market with a higher standard of, of excellence all the way across the board. And the other thing I want to tell you too is, and I just want to put this out into the world um, for anybody who I haven't put to sleep already droning on endlessly. No, you're is doing that, great. You know, win, lose, or draw, something's going to happen tomorrow. You know, if you go out of business today, no sweat. Yeah. There's always going to be another Monday. The sun's going to come up. There's going to be opportunity. One of the, the number one reason that I wanted to do this as a business was because I felt like, you know, when I started my first company back in the 80s, right, 
it was enormously easier. It was less mm-hmm. complex. There were less challenges. There was, you know, you'd hang a shingle up and take, start taking money in and hope the tax guys didn't catch on for a couple of years. You know, that's what we did. Mm-hmm. And now everything's super complex and it's really hard and there's so much competition. And what I wanted to do was kind of equip people to, to young people, especially to prosper in business, to learn their craft, to learn to manage commercial relationships, to learn to, you know, and it, and it doesn't mean succeeding because failure, you know, a test only shows you what you don't know. So it's okay to fail. It's, it's, it's important not the end to of the fail. world. It's important to fail so that you can learn how to recover as a part of business. I'm super good at failure. Me too. Me too. But I've been able to be successful at a couple of things too. So it keeps you motivated, right? Like, but you have to learn how to fail and you have to learn how to make mistakes. This goes back to the roastery too. And I know that, I know that you'll agree with this. You know, the only way to learn to roast great coffee is to roast a bunch of crappy coffee. Yep. Mm. And I, and you know, with regards to tasting the roasting system, so there are a couple things that, that we should mention. Go ahead. So people, what one place where this data has kind of gone off the rails a little bit is people think that they can roast coffee on popcorn poppers that you can't taste the roasting system. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. And, you know, like this, this whole little cottage industry of super sciencey home roasters that think they're going to master roasting. Well, I'm sorry, dudes, you, you got to roast like, you know, we're talking 10,000 hours to mastery, right? I mean, just stop and think about that for a second. What, you can't be a must, master roaster after six months? Really? Probably. Well, I mean, not unless you're doing a million pounds a week, maybe, you know, I, was I mean. clearly being sarcastic. The number right. of people that register for stuff will tell me, they'll introduce themselves through email and tell me that they're a master roaster and they've been doing it for 18 months. <laughs> Yeah. Well, they know everything about coffee. I'm like, I've been doing this nearly 20 years and I don't think I know anything about coffee. And I know a little bit. Well, Uh and that's, that's like the wild card, right? I mean, like what I tell people all the time, and I'll cop to this, what I tell people is basically for all practical intents and purposes, we, we've built a slightly better hammer, right? (laughs) And what we really want to do is teach people how to swing the hammer. Right. And the hard part of roasting is not the machinery. Usually, there are exceptions, but it's the coffee. The coffee is a super wild card. Every time you put something in the drum, it's a little different. Yep. You know, and I, so I think your work is super good and super valid, but I do think like everything else online, it's been taken out of context. People are like, oh, this is, I'm, I've mastered this. This is the best coffee I ever had. Uh, well, maybe it is, but it's not the best coffee we've ever had. Can I just say something there um, that we need to put out there? We haven't put it out there in this conversation, and we've all three of us in separate discussions I've had with you uh, have mentioned this. The idea of naming something as good coffee or not good coffee. Um, text, taste is subjective. So what I think is good you, again, I think taste terrible. Um, I, I had a friend who was a very well-renowned coffee person in the industry. And uh, every time we went somewhere to drink coffee together all over the world, we, we had very, very different fl- um, ideas of what good coffee tasted like and what good coffee did not taste like. Mm-hmm. And that's just because we had different preferences in what we liked. I really like natural coffees provided mm. that they're roasted uh, a certain way. But I have a tendency towards natural coffees and this person despises natural coffees. Um, it's one of those things where we need to get the message out there. You're allowed to like whatever the fuck you like. Just well, understand why you like it. Understand how to achieve what you think is a good roast. Let me... Let me tell you a funny story about this. And, mm-hmm. and I, you know, I learned this. I, I did. I, I actually, the SCA system taught me something. <laughs> <laughs> when I, when I learned it, you know, you do, you do the greens grading, right? You're at the cupping table and you're grading greens. You know, you're, you're kind of supposed to approach that green in the most favorable mindset possible. Right. Uh-huh. 
<laughs> and I went, oh, okay, I got that right on the test and we're golden. So like a couple of years later, when I, I brought Derek in and, uh, you know, Derek is a genius in all things culinary. You know, he's a, he was trained as an executive chef at a professional culinary school, won awards. He won the mustard festival one year, believe it or not. I, you ever run into that up in Napa Valley? <laughs> yeah. He's a big deal, right? Okay. I believe he's, you. He's working for you. Well, I'm, I'm a ruthless harvester of talent. And by the way, if you are planning on moving to Minnesota, let me know. So, <laughs> so here's the story. So we're shorthanded one day and we're unloading containers. And Derek, besides all of his other multitudinous talents, really drives a forklift great, right? He's like okay. a professional forklift guy. So I've got him over at the warehouse and we're unloading containers. It's like 100 degrees and it's container after container after container. And it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. They haven't had a break all day. And I, I go over to Burger King and I buy hamburgers for the guys just to get them something, right? Mm -hmm. And I pass them out and I'm thinking in the back of my head, I'm like, oh God, you know, Derek's going to be like a hamburger, <laughs> right? This is what he does. He unwraps it. He takes a bite and he looks at me and he says, this tomato is really fresh. Right <laughs> now, I, he does this. He, you know, he and he's really taught me this. Really. He, so we talk about preference, like, dislike. Derek rigorously finds the value in every single cup, every single roast, every mm -hmm. single seed. He'll identify. He'll key in and identify, and and he'll speak to it. He'll say, you know what. This is this has got good caramelization. You know what? This has got pretty good body, right? He's he's relentlessly positive about every single coffee, every single cup, every single roast. He always finds that thing that he wants to bring forward and accentuate and make part of that that thing. And I think that's the difference between amateur and professional coffee. I think he's a consummate professional culinary artist, and he brings that to coffee. And and I. I have met a couple of people like that and I find drinking coffee with them not not to – I can't wait to have a coffee with Derek, um, but I find them eternally frustrating if if I'm having a coffee with them and they want to sit there and argue with me about the fact that I'm drinking a coffee that I don't like. No. And, and No, but what I'm – my yeah, point no, with, with that – you know what I'm saying? It's that yeah, it's sure. a wonderful perspective. I'm not sitting there – disliking coffee because I want to dislike it and it's not that I can't find the the great in it it's that what I would love to see happen is people come at coffee with a balanced approach so most people will just say I like it or I hate it and and that's a great place to start but what we want is people that say I really like the caramelization in this cup but what I think it's lacking is I can taste that it's vegetal and I understand that that's probably an underdeveloped coffee mm -hmm. because it's vegetal. And I think that when I roast it next time, I could probably develop that more. And sure. while I think it's wonderful to have people who can find the positive, like find something you can like in every cup, but have the balanced side of that of not necessarily criticizing the cup, but being analytical about understanding what it is that you can approach in our team at Mapper Forward. We're always a, about we're going to celebrate what we do well, but how we also have to identify how we could do it better. I and, think that's exactly right. I think that's that is really the place where you start to develop a sense of craft. Right, and and I you think what do Anne's that. doing is saying to people, that, and and this is the kindest way I can put it. I think what Anne is saying, stop blaming your tools. Well, sure. Quit, quit blaming the, quit blaming. Well, and I talk about this in my video, quit blaming the roaster, quit blaming the machinery, quit blaming the green, quit blaming the importer, right. quit blaming the extraction, you know, become a, a well-rounded professional and learn how to do all of these things competently mm. and good things are going to happen to you. And understand what it is behind it. Go ahead, Anne. And, and I and I think the 
like you say, and I, I said the same thing. I loved how you said that roasting is cooking. And I know a lot of people don't like that analogy sometimes, but essentially that's what we're doing. And, and we're, we're taking the beans through, you know, a physical change in response to heat um, application. And as a result, there's a change in the structure of the coffee that's, that, that's then related to flavour. So it's, yeah, practising and knowing and tasting and um, – but it's then knowing how to back yourself up. Um, right. You know, with – I've tasted it, it tastes underdeveloped, how do I fix it? Right. That's the – it's that feedback loop back to how do I fix it um, that, you know, can, can trick people up if they don't back themselves up with the right information and, and data. Right. Yeah. And speaking about data, uh, I don't know how this happened, but we've only got five minutes left. And cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have some data that you want to tell us about. Yeah. So I think um, as part of the research, I think it was, it's also really important um, I just, you know, want to touch on as well. I do want to like, you know, for the viewers in terms of the whole idea of the research, we weren't endorsing a particular profile I want to make sure that that was you know really clear we weren't telling people to roast you know mm -hmm. with this profile we just had a control and that control is what was driving what we had to match basically we just had to match the control we had to learn how to drive the individual machines in order to then you know get those profiles to match right. and then of course then you know based on the triangulation the the idea was, was then to show by tasting technically because they've been taken through the same cooking process um, that they technically should taste the same and there shouldn't be I mean just because you use a probat and then you jump on a lowering you very different controls very different design you're naturally going to drive those machines incredibly differently to make the coffee reach the same points and that's where people get mixed up and think that um you know, the way that you drive the machines is also going to have, you know, you're going to taste that. Um, so we were coming at it from that, that, you know, perspective of it's been taken through the same physical changes at the same time um, kind of thing. So, yeah, testing it by, by tasting. But then I wanted to start tapping in more um, scientific um, analysis. So um, I got a, um, a science friend of mine who's part of the Australian Coffee Science Lab, uh, Monica. Um, and so she, we went to um, La Trobe University. In Melbourne. And, yep. And we went to the, um, the science department where we um, – we put the beans, the the ones that we did in the triangulations, we put them under the microscope um, to sort of analyse and see structurally how do they look under the microscope. And then we used the exact same grind that we used for the triangulation and all of the colour measurements and we then put that um, it was really cool. We had to go to the archaeology department um, nice. and then do the particle analysis um, on the size of the um, – of the because we wanted to see uh, the the idea was that well if they've been cooked the same with the same profile are they chopping the same I mean we're we're thinking we're using the same grind setting but then are they chopping the same and will they show that also under the um, under analysis as well so she has the ability to do that this really amazing bit of equipment where it passes goes past a laser um and that oh, laser wow. is then basically yeah um analyzing the site and it just takes an average of all of the readings um and maps out the way that they're that they're reading so um yeah the research is really quite promising um in that it is essentially confirming um that they're showing the same um or similar in the particle size analysis wow. so it's just not it's just nice to have some scientific confirmation in the, in the sense from, and I'm coming at it from that cooking perspective. For me, it's about, I've taken the beans through a similar heat um, and a, a similar reaction at the same time. So it doesn't matter that it's on, you know, Mill City, Probat, Lorraine, Diedrich, whatever. Um, yes, it's different because of the way that we get there, the way that we have to control the machines, but technically the beans are going through the same physical change. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do we show that? Yeah. So, and again, it's it's really about 
again, making roasters just pull their socks up and really own up to understanding everything that they need to do uh, with their roasting and backing themselves up um, with the right information. Are you going to be releasing an article on that? Well, that was the idea. Um, and again, like this is this is all, you know, still work in progress. The idea was to um, do another release either through Roast Mag or through their online platform, um, as well as talk about it in, in Portland. Um, yeah, great. When we, when we do the SCA, because we do in the In 25 the years from now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we've been sitting on this for since last year, um, this, this scientific, because we wanted to release it. Um, when we did the when we did the workshop um, at Expo, um, well, thanks again, for telling it, everyone here about it. That's exciting. Oh, pleasure. Uh, thank you, and thank you to Rob if he's if he's still watching. In terms of um, you know allowing me to talk about it and sort of say, hey, you know, this is another element to how we're trying to show um, you know the, the premise behind the research. Um, and yeah, oh, awesome. So it's, um, it's quite exciting. Awesome. Have you have you played around with? we we've done this have you played around with hand grinding no no so so you will find that that if if you hand grind you will notice immediately a correlation between outer and inner bean color and the amount of force and it's interesting because it's yeah, a tactile cool. yep. it's an immediately tactile thing you can That's tell how yeah, that's how cool. uh, fragile the, Actually, the seed has become. That's so cool you brought that up because the next part of the science um, we had to get approval to get access to the equipment was pressure testing the bean. So mm -hmm. we kind of like similar premise with the hand grinding is that we can then get access to. So basically, yeah, at what point um, are the beans yeah um, reacting to the pressure? When do they when do they is become that a density real? thing? Like, yeah, basically, yeah. Um, it is. It's it's a density thing. It's also um, when you grind. We we talk about roasting for solubility. Mm, yep. Right. And there's we you know we've kind of played around with roast profiles that maximize solubility without crossing over into uh, roast flavor. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're talking light roasted coffees with maximum solubility. Yep. And one of the one of the things that we again we're measuring inner and outer bean color and as I, it's just something we played around with is actually running a hand grinder and you can immediately feel the difference. Mm. Oh, it's I a, imagine. That's really cool. You know, no, I don't know how you, re, you it's not a thing you can record. You know, I guess you, maybe you could put a force, you know, you could, you could, you could do that. But, you know, I think that I, I think that there's a, there's a super sciencey aspect to this where people have that, like this childlike idea that, oh, we're going to, we're going to figure this out and every cup is going to be perfect. And I don't, I don't think that's real. No. And I'll, I'll tell you the, the number one reason, just for instance, Nobody I know that's doing high quality specialty coffee is using automation in any way, shape, or form. And the reason they're not doing that is because there is no technology to gauge the amount of latent heat contained within the roasting system. There's no way to do that. There's no, there, it, it, there's, you know, at least nobody I know has figured out a way to do that. So the, the yes. standard deviation of event times to temperature is all over the map for automation because every time you start a batch, you've got a subtly different amount of latent energy in the system. There's overshoot and undershoot. Mm -hmm. And that, that can't be measured. It can only be observed as to what ha what is happening to the seed. I can't see the heat, but I can see what it does in the trier. Yep. I can smell it. I can see it. So this is, you know, I'm not a Luddite. I'm not a <laughs> hater. <laughs> You're wearing a but, shirt like that. You can't be a hater. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, this is, this is just, it's stuff to play with. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can imagine. Absolutely. I could see, see the intuitive aspect of hand grinding your own coffee will give you an extra bit of information that, um, mm -hmm. you know, having, if you do it consistently and enough times. You know, maybe I know we have to go, but. I'll just say this, at the end of the day, 
I have faith and I trust in people's innate abilities to master the tool. And I, I don't think it's an intellectual thing. I think it's, I think it's like driving a car or riding a bike. I think it's got to become intuitive and you, you, yep. you start to feel it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And until you're at that level where you know that you are feeling the thing, you know, the first time that I, I knew that I had that, we went to Roaster's Guild Retreat and somebody was running a 2K and I was watching and I kept reaching over to turn their drum speed or their airflow because I could tell from the sound of the roaster that they were running their drum speed way too low. You know what I mean? Yep. It was like, oh yeah, yeah. okay, I'm sorry, I need to back off. You need to screw this up <laughs> so you understand what's going on. Yeah. But I, I do. I think I, the, car anal the car analogy is perfect. Um, yeah. In in terms of like being spatially aware, I I, I was going to talk about. Um, sorry, I was. Gonna, I know we're going over time, but like, sure. I was going to say in my presentation, I forgot that analogy of. It's like when you get into a rental, the first thing you do is you you set yourself up. You work out, you know, spatially how you feel in the car. You get your seat all comfy. You work out where your indicators and your lights are, all that kind of stuff. And it's the same when you step up to a roaster. You, you've got to learn how to control that mm -hmm. machine the same way you, you need to learn how to control that different car. Um, and you're still going to follow a similar roadmap. Um, you're just going to just maybe potentially drive it differently because of the car that you're driving. Right. Um, that kind of thing. So, right. yeah. Well, Thank you so much to both of you for showing up to this conversation. It was enlightening and um, I have a lot of respect for both of you. Thanks for doing this and in, in, a, in so much gratitude to you. And for anyone who's watching, um, if you would like to join the mastermind groups, head to mapperforward.org forward slash group coaching if you want to join Anne's mastermind groups. The places have already started filling up, so make sure that you do join them. Um, also, show us some love by subscribing to this YouTube channel, please. We are trying to hit a 1,000 subscribers, so we'd love some help doing that. Um, we have posted links for Mill City's website and Instagram as well as the YouTube channel. Please check it out. Absolutely. And Anne's website is eqmr.com.au. Please go check it out. And uh, we are... Are about to end the broadcast there will be a video we are making a bit of an announcement after this so please do check that out too and you're amazing thank you so much for all your time and preparation in this the link Pleasure. to your where, um, article is in the show notes below we can't wait to see all the cool shit that you've got coming up thank you so much thank you <laughs> and steve thank you to you for for doing what you do and being open to letting us continue to do this, even though COVID yeah, kind of so screwed the, the, the thoughts you. up. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day, everyone. Stay safe and healthy.